What is neuroscience and what do we know about brain development? What challenges do we face and what are the limitations of current research? In this short video, we hear from several leading neuroscientists who reflect on these questions and consider remaining gaps in our knowledge that we still need to address. We study the brain to understand child development for many different reasons. If our starting point is that we need the brain to behave and act and decide in certain ways around the world, then it's obviously important to try and understand how the brain changes and development, uh, develops to understand child development. Now one thing that we've learned about brain development is that different parts of the brain develop at different rates. So for instance, those parts of the brain that are important for vision or for hearing things, they develop relatively early. Whereas those parts of the brain that we need for regulating our behavior, for making plans, for following up on those plans, they develop relatively late. And understanding those different developmental time courses can help us understand why children behave the way they do and how that changes throughout childhood. Neuroscience is a scientific discipline in which we try to understand the development and also the functioning of the brain, not just the human brain, but also the animal brain. And uh, what it allows us, for example, to do is to understand the mechanisms that underlie certain thoughts or, for example, actions such as when you laugh or when you cry. And what is really uh, important to realize is that neuroscience can provide a lot of answers about the mechanisms, but it can't provide all the answers of how we become the person that we are. And it's really important to realize it's just one piece of the puzzle. And we need to look to psychology, we need to look to sociology, we need to look to genetics as well, in order to provide a full picture of the human development. When you look at the way the brain develops, it's the most extraordinary kind of orchestra of biological events. Um, within the womb, it's already kind of creating itself in a very complex set of interactions between molecules and the environment that the, the fetus is finding itself within. Um, and the, the way that the brain uh, uh, organises itself starts to become increasingly influenced by the environment that it finds itself in, particularly after birth. And the way that this seems to work is that the brain generates a huge number of neurons. So even at the point of birth, you know, babies have pretty much the full complement of neurons. And they have an enormous number of, of synaptic connections, that connections between one neuron and another. In fact, they have more than we do as adults. So it's almost as if you begin life with everything in your brain is connected to almost everything else. And then what the environment is doing is helping gradually to shape the, uh, those connections so that the ones that really work and help the child learn are kept and the others that are less important get slowly pruned out so that it becomes a really efficient information learning processing machine and that process of pruning of synapses in the um, towards the task of, of, of the child becoming increasingly sophisticated and expert and, 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 and clever and socially aware all of those things are shaped by the environment the child is, is finding himself in. So the brain is like this plastic organ that is constantly responding to the environmental inputs that it, it experiences uh, and adapting and building and, and, and moulding itself to the social environment. As neuroscientists, we have um, a big toolkit available to study the brain of uh, young people. And one of the most widely used and safest method is functional magnetic resonance imaging, or short fMRI. So what's important to understand is that in the human brain, especially with uh, young people, but uh, also mostly with adults, we, do, we can only uh, measure brain activity or neuronal activity indirectly. That means we need to rely on a substitute measure and in the case of fMRI this is blood flow. So it is really a very straightforward yet brilliant uh, way to look at brain function. So imagine you are engaging in a task such as laughing. So you're watching a funny cartoon and you're laughing. The brain area that supports laughing and that supports the comprehension of uh, you know funny content will need fuel 
to support this task. This fuel in the human brain comes in the form of oxygen and glucose. So glucose being sugar. And blood, in fact, can carry such oxygen to the brain area where it is needed. What is really interesting is that blood actually has magnetic properties. So blood that carries oxygen molecules is differentially magnetic than blood that doesn't carry oxygen. So now imagine there is this brain area that is engaged in laughing or helps to support the function of laughing and it needs this oxygen and the blood flow delivers it, drops the oxygen. In this very moment, the magnetic properties change in this particular area. Now, if you, if you uh, have ever seen an fMRI machine, it is this, uh, it's like a huge circular machine that is in fact nothing but a magnet. And this powerful magnet allows us to detect these subtle changes in blood flow in the brain. And what is most important, I think, for, for everybody to know is that this has nothing to do with x-ray. It's a very safe method and it is so safe in part because it doesn't involve any harmful radiation. So this is why we can use this uh, machine or this method to work with young people and also to conduct repeated measurements. There are a few questions that we should ask when someone makes a claim about neuroscience. I think the first and probably most important one is, um, is whether that claim is based on a scientific study that's been published. So you know, scientific publication is the one way in which we can ensure that the science is really solid um, because it undergoes peer review. Our peers read it and they comment and they say whether this actually passes certain criteria. So that's a really important first question that you need to answer, uh, ask is whether this is based in um, a scientific result. And then there are some follow-up questions that um, you would need to ask in terms of um, was the research done in humans? Um, sometimes studies are being done on animals and that's obviously a very different kettle of fish. Uh, the next question is was the research done in children and what kind of experiences did those children have? Was you know, maltreatment, for instance, uh, involved? Um, of course, if you want to understand um, any particular changes in the brain as a function of maltreatment, you also need to have a control group basically children that haven't experienced something like maltreatment because only those types of studies really allow you to make a strong inference based on the neuroscience behind it. Just because there's a picture of a brain involved in any report of um, a finding, we need to be really mindful to actually question that finding nonetheless. I think there are only so many things that neuroscience can tell us and we need to be quite careful and very critical of what it can and can't tell us. I think research in the future will have to take us down a longitudinal road. So what we are currently doing or what we have been doing is we have been looking at snapshots of these young people in time. So we have been uh, doing what is called a cross-sectional study. So that means we're just looking at these young people at this moment in time and see if the early experiences have had some impact on brain development right now. But what we really want to know and what is still absolutely unclear is how does, uh, how does brain development move on from here? So we should, actually, uh, we should actually follow these young people into puberty, into adulthood and conduct what is known as a longitudinal study. It is in fact the case that the majority of young people who have experienced maltreatment do not go on to develop severe uh, psychological health issues or mental health issues. And this really raises the question is at which point does this change? So what are the factors that promote such change? For example, we should be having a look as to what happens in puberty. So does social support, you know, play a role in, in making sure that these people bounce back from those difficult experiences? But all of these are questions that we can only answer if we follow these young people uh, for a longer time span rather than just looking at them at one single time.